Can you give a little background? Yeah, well, this is a new piece. Oh, okay. So okay. You, uh, you, you should be able to jump, to jump right in. The Gemara says, we are on page 16a, Tet Zayin Amud Aleph. If you're following in the art scroll in English, on 16a2. Right smack dab in the middle of the street, in the middle of the uh, Gemara. My Binayu, sorry, uh, right under my Binayu. My Haramoria. What is Haramoria? Where is this mountain, Haramoria, where uh, the Moshe Rabenu met God, so to speak, with the burning bush, where the Beit HaMikdash is, is built? Now, the reason why the Gemara is discussing this is because if you remember when we were talking about um, the various prayers, the Gemara said, oh, that, that we only do when we're in the east gate of the Beit HaMikdash, you know, on the Temple Mount. So we've mentioned Temple Mount. So now we're going back to this, to the naming of Temple Mount and why it has this unique name, Har HaMoriah. Pligi ba Reb Levi ba Hamirab Hanina. Another reason why we'll be referencing this is because we've had a string of teachings from Rabbi Chama ba Hanina. Chad Amar, one says, Har Shiatam Menu Hora'a. A mountain that from there we came, uh, emerged or emanated Hora'a, instructions, teaching, the Peske Halacha. Because from that mountain we learned all the halakot li Israel. Vichadamar once says, Hashiatam menu mora leovde kochavim. A mountain that from it emanated mora, which means fear to the nations of the world. Why? They were witness it. They were witness to the fact that Bore Olam gave the Torah to the Jewish people, and they understood already from the context what had happened to the fact that God uh, chose these people and took them out of Egypt, what he did to the day's preeminent military power in the world, which was the Egyptian, uh, which was the Egyptian kingdom. So when, when they saw that not only had God done this kind of one-time favor, shining His light on the Jewish people, but it actually went further than that. God was giving them the Torah. They understood this was going to be a long-term relationship, and that filled the nations of the world with fear. In fact, we find this already preceding the story of Har Sinai. In the story of Az Yashir, we say, Chil Achaz Yosheveh Pilashet, right? Yohazemo Rad. They melted, they were trembling, they feared. So they were also, they already saw that the way things were going, that the Jewish people were going to sweep through uh, and eventually find their, their promised land in Eretz Israel. So there was a fear at the time of the Jewish people. It's a funny thing to, 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 have, to kind of have that uh, understanding because that's not something we've ever really felt really, in our, in our life experience. You know, Jews, we fear. We fear the nations of the world. We fear anti-Semitism. You know, they don't fear us. Like Jackie Mason says, no one ever saw a bunch of Jews walking down the street and say, oh boy, we better cross the street. Jews are coming. <laughs> That's never happened, right? The one time that I can remember in recent history where this was the case was post-1948, after the Jews had given a beatdown to the Arab nations, post uh, uh, 67, the Arabs were afraid of the Jews in Israel. Because in their cultures, when you won the war, what did you do? You took revenge. You know, you raped the women, you stole the properties. That's what goes on. I mean, you see what's going on with ISIS when they travel, when they go through these areas, what they're doing to the Yazidis, etc., etc. So they were terrified. But that's not something that we normally live with, okay? Says the Gemara, it's called Hara Moria. Because it's a mountain of fear. Interestingly, to think of the name of the mountain of, uh, of Haramoria, of, uh, of the, the Temple Mount, okay? This place, which was uh, uh, the, temp the place where the Beit HaMikdash was going to be built, uh, where the Akedah was, that that should be a place that people are afraid of. We don't call it Fear Mount. We don't call it Halakha Mount. But the Torah is telling us that that's part of its name. So one, just one last piece. Is the mountain of Haramoria, is that the mountain where, uh, where God gave the Torah? No. So why are we calling it Haramoria, a place where we learned all the halachot from? So one interpretation is the fact that that's where the Sanhedrin would sit. That's where they were posek halacha, the highest court in the land was there. So that's why we're referring to that place as the mountain of Hora'a, of Psak halacha, of instruction. But there's a fascinating Yonatan in Uziel, in Targum Yonatan. He writes something unbelievable. And this, for me, was always something that was incredibly powerful. I always wonder, isn't it a weird thing that Judaism has two mountains? Like Hara Sinai and Hara Moria. 
you'd think Judaism is usually a very, like everything's always connected to everything else, like this, and that's why it is, and that's, like you'd imagine that if God was going to have one mountain be, the, the mountain on which you build the Beit HaMikdash, and one, you know, you imagine that God's going to give Torah on a mountain, where is he going to give it? On the same mountain. And by the way, think of all the things that happen on Har Moriah. All the great things happen at Moriah. The world begins its creation from that point. That is creation point. Okay? Akedat Yitzchak. Right? Where Yaakov has his dream. Har Moriah. All these things, they happen in the same mountain. And then Hashem's like, where am I going to get the Torah? I need a mountain. Oh, it's Har Moriah. There's someone already parked there. There's no parking available. Hashem's like, okay, we got to do Har Sinai. Says the Tagum Yonatan in Uziel. HaKadosh Baruch transported the earth, the sand, the mud, the ground from Har Moriah, and he placed it on Har Sinai at that time. So when God was giving the Torah, it was given on this combination mountain of Har Sinai and Har Moriah. Isn't that wild? So there we would understand the deeper understanding that according to the opinion of, uh, ha, of the mountain of fear and the mountain of Hora'ah being associated with Har Sinai according to to Targum Yonatan and Uziel. But assuming you're not following this, you're following the, more eso- the less esoteric understanding, your understanding is that we're talking about Temple Mount, so what was the fear that emanated from that mountain? The other way of understanding that is the Gemara says that the nations of the world were terribly afraid of the Beit HaMikdash because they knew that that was the conduit that the Jewish people had to God. So therefore there's this nation that has this direct line, they have the, the bat phone, they could call at any time, so that's a, that was a very scary thing for them, and that was why uh, they wanted to destroy it. Okay, let's carry on. On these special days of prayer, of the fast days, an elder amongst them, the, the, oldest, the oldest person amongst them, would say, he would talk to them in words, that would uh, subdue the heart, words that would make the person feel uh, a contrite, okay? We learned in the Braita. If there's an elder, Omer Zaken, the elder would say, what if there's no elder amongst them? Omer Chacham says they call a wise person. And if there's no wise person, Omer Adam Shel a person of form. We'll see what that means in a second. What does that mean? What's, these, what's this hierarchy? A man of stature. What's this hierarchy? First comes an old guy. Then, if you can't find an old guy, get a chacham. You can't find a chacham, get a, get a man of stature. An important person. A person which is noteworthy. Different opinions, different opinions about what surah is. It could be a person who's very tall. It could be a person who's very knowledgeable in other things. He's not a chacham, right? But he is a scientist. You can get a person who's a doctor, a person who's well-respected, a person who uh, has something striking about him. Maybe he knows a lot, but he's not yet a Talmi Chacham, okay? So he's a person of stature. He's an important person. Let's say it's the president of Beit HaKnesset. Something that sets that person apart where you think this is a person that they're going to listen to. So though, that's the hierarchy. Ask the Gemara, one second. Atu zaken de ka'amri afagav de lav chachamu. When you said an elderly person, did you mean he's old even if he's not wise? Obviously, we'd rather a wise person. The guy is going to quote you Pesukim. He's going to try and give you, bring you to Teshuvah. He's going to try and teach you the, the, you know, the folly of your ways. It makes more sense that just to get, to get a wise guy than to get an old guy. Obviously not a wise guy, but a wise guy. Says the Gemara, Amara This is what it means. Im yesh zaken. And the Gemara is, being, is explaining that because it seems like if there's an old guy, get a, if there's a Chacham indicating that the first guy was not a Chacham. Right? Says Abaye Achikam, this is what it means to say. If there's an elder and he's wise, Omer Zaken, Omer, he speaks. Zaken Vuchacham, that he goes. Vim Lav, and if there's no Zaken Vuchacham, Omer Chacham, we say to the Chacham, even if he's not a Zaken, then we get a young scholar. Vim Lav, and if there's no old scholar or young scholar, Vim Lav, Omer Adam Shel a person of note of stature. I think if you follow the flow now, according to Abaye, Really, the whole point here is we're trying to find someone that's actually going to get through the people. 
So if you could choose between an old scholar and a young scholar, people generally, that people, you know, if you have a young rabbi, a lot of times people say, what does this guy know? He's been married for three minutes. I'm going to take marriage advice from him. What does this guy know about the world? Does he know that he lived through the Depression? Did he, what does he know? He doesn't know anything. Right? I was alive in the Holocaust. I saw great rabbis. So the, we'll rather choose an older chacham than a younger chacham. Mm-hmm. And if there's no chacham, there's no one that can impart that wisdom, at least we'll get someone who they might listen to for other reasons, okay? Says the Gemara, and the Gemara continues. <clears throat> um, Achinu, what does the guy say? My brothers, lo sakvitanit gormim. It is not sackcloth, it is not ashes, it is not ta'anit fasting that caused HaKadosh Baruch Hu to change his mind about the dearth of rain, about the famine. tovim. Rather, it is repentance and it is good deeds that are gormim. Shiken matzinu ba'anshe Nineveh, when the people of Nineveh sinned and God was going to turn them over in the story of Jonah. What up? Shout out Jonah. Shalom ne'emar bahem. It does not say in the story of Jonah, Vayera ha'elohim et sakam. Vayera elohim et sakam et anitam. God saw their sackcloth. God saw their fasting. Ela vayera elohim. God saw et ma'asem. He saw their deeds. Ki shavu midarkam ara'ah. That they returned from their evil ways. Vayit kasu sakim ha'adam ve'abehemah. Now, when God saw that the people had done teshubah, that's what God saw that made him change his mind. So the person says, guys, we're fasting, but let's not get lost in the fast. And we're wearing sackcloth, we're putting ashes on our foreheads, like we said just earlier. We're putting ashes on the... But sprinkling ashes, not ash Wednesday. They're not the, we don't believe in this kind of thing. The point of what you're doing is to humiliate, so to speak. Not humiliate as much as humble yourself in front of God. Recognize that you're not perfect, and you could and you must do better. So that's what this is about. Do not lose focus. Plug in and do what you can to turn this, the, the, the nature of our story around. And he brings the pasuk. He quotes them the pasuk from Yonah. So you see that the pasuk indicates exactly what he said. The pasuk over there in Nineveh continues and says, And they covered themselves with sackcloth. Ha'adam ve'habayamah. The, the man, the men and the animals. Now, from the fact that we juxtapose, we connect ha'adam ve'abe'ema, it makes it sound like we put sackcloth on the animals. My havi avdi, what did they do? Why would they put sackcloth on the animals? Now, there's two ways of understanding what the Gemara's question here is. One way of understanding the Gemara's question is here is why would they put sackcloth on, on animals? Why would they do that? That doesn't make any sense. That's ridiculous. It must be that it means something else. Okay? The other way, ironically, of understanding this is exactly the opposite is that there's no point in calling, in putting sackcloth on animals. You know why? Because that's what they wear anyway. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but the Arabs, when they take like a donkey out, and the, they, they cover them with like this heavy, almost like a canvas, like a burlap sack. That's what sackcloth is. Why are they covering it? They don't want it to get dusty. They're trying to save it or protect it from the sun so the animal doesn't overheat, get a heat stroke and die, okay? So this was something that wasn't extraordinary. So the irony is you could read the Gemara's question in exactly parallel opposite uh, sides of the coin. Either, it's ridiculous, why would we ever do that? That's so unusual. Or, that's so usual. Why would that be something that stood out, that they were covering the animals with sackcloth? In fact, if you go back in the Gemara, you'll see that there's two opinions earlier in why we wear sackcloth. If you remember the Gemara, those who were in that class, one of the reasons why we, wear, we, wear, we put on sackcloth is as machloket, if you remember, between Rav Levi and Rav Chanina, where one of them said the reason, and one of the reasons is, reason why we wear sackcloth is to say in front of God, we are, it's as if we are animals. One opinion is because they made these burlap sacks out of the fur of the animals. The other opinion was, that's how they covered their animals. So you see over here, again, we're connecting the Gemaraz that we learned right. to the Gemaraz that we're learning. And as you learn more and more, you're able to understand the finer and a deeper appreciation for everything that you're saying in the Gemara. Okay? So the Gemara asks, what does it mean? It says that they covered themselves with sackcloth, the men and the animals. The people and the animals. What did they do? They took the animals separately, the, the mothers, the, uh, you know, of the animals, and the children, the baby, the calves, the lambs, they separated them. Amru lefanav. Now there's a machlok at what this means. Either it means that they tied them apart so they couldn't come back together, the, the, the elder animals and the younger animals. Okay? They would, they would separate them, forced, they forced them to be a separate apart. 
The other opinion is that asra means that they tied them, perhaps even using the sackcloth that they normally use to cover them, they tied them so they would be unable to, to nurse from the mother animal. Okay? And what did they say? Amru lefanav. They said in front of God, Ribono shel ha'mes of the world, if if you do not have pity on us and rescind the gezera, the decree on us, en anu merachavim aledu, we also will not have mercy on these animals. Now that sounds like a threat to God. That's wild. How are you going to, you, you need teshuvah and that's how you speak to God? Condition. Condition, you know, but not just that, threatening him. Mm-hmm. Threatening him. If you don't, then we're not going to. So I think there's a few ways of understanding what they were saying. What they were saying to God is, just as in this scenario, these are helpless animals that they are completely at our whim. We could decide what we want to do and they will be completely at our mercy. So too, Borei Olam, we, this is how we see ourselves now. So they weren't doing it with an arrogance. They weren't doing it with a threat to God. They were saying to God, if in this scenario, if we don't have pity on them, they'll die. So too, Borei Olam, if you don't have pity on us, we recognize we will die. Got it? They were comparing themselves to the animals. To the animals, to the helplessness right. that the animals were in humbling. in this moment. They were humbling themselves. Humbling themselves, exactly. And I'll prove it to you in just one second from the Gemara. Stay same, tuned. We had the same thing last time when they went to the graves. Exactly. Same thing with the graves. Exactly. Now, one, one last bit I want to add to this, okay, which is, I think is really important. Today, when we pray, we pray with words. And the, the, the religious symbolism that we have is limited to the words or the things that we have specifically uh, um, uh, delineated by the Torah. So as an example, do we have religious or sacred objects? Yeah. 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 Yes. What do we have? Tefillin, uh, lulav, etrog. Menorah. Things that the Torah is a menorah. So that's midrabanan. But again, the rabbis told you to do that. We don't have other random things that we attach holiness to. We don't have other random things that we use in our prayer. Like no one has ever said to God in this room, like you see this cup, this cup is filled with a blessing, filled with water. So too should you fill me with water. We don't use props. Holy water, all that crap. But if you look in the, in the Nevi'im, you see that they use props all the time. Shaul, right? He doesn't want to give up the kingdom. And he's begging Shemuel. Shemuel says, Hashem's going to take it away from you. He's giving the kingdom to David. He turns away from Shaul. Shaul grabs his clothing. What happens? His, his me'il, his clothing, his jacket rips in the hands of Shaul. Shemuel says, just as my me'il has ripped, so has God ripped the kingdom away from you. But that's just symbolism. Props. Symbolism. We don't do that today. But they did. The Nevi'im did. In fact, even the false prophets that came to Israel, they used false symbolism. But I always point out that if they were trying to pass themselves off as real Nevi'im, they wouldn't have used symbolism if the real Nevi'im were not also using it. By the way, you find it all the time in the Nach. Take these two things in your hand and say to the Jewish people, just as these two sticks are held in my hand. Well, what is, what is all that? The answer is, you know what that is? That was taking some physical thing and having it be a prop, a, uh, a mechanism by which to engage the person's uh, mind beyond just the words. There are people who are visual learners, right? That w- that's what helped them understand. And really, on a certain level, that's what the whole level of the seder is really supposed to evoke in us, okay? So, so here, they were employing that methodology. But they were using it in prayer. Okay? And how do we know that? Because the next Pesukim say, says, Elohim And they called out to God mightily. We, they called out with strength. If they were challenging God with arrogance, like if you don't, then we're not going to let these, right? That would never, that's not calling out to God with strength, with uh, mightily. My Amur. What does that mean? And they called out to God with strength. Amru the Fanav, they said in front of God, a person who's downtrodden and a person who's strong. A righteous person and a wicked person. In the end, who concedes? Who gives in? 
You know, who's the bigger man? The Sadiq. The She'enu Aluv, the one that's not downtrodden. You God, therefore, in this interaction between us and you, you should yield. Because you're the Tzadik. You understand? You're the Aluv. You're the Enu Aluv. Please, Borei Olam, you know, Vayinachem. What does yielding mean? Over here means that we're at an impasse. We've done all these sins. You feel like we should be punished. We're doing our very best to, to pray, but end of the day, only you could give in. Oh, yeah. Either we, something's got to give here. Please let it be the way it normally is with an aluv, and an eno aluv, and a tzaddik ven rasha. It's literally the words, if you think about it, of Paro. Paro says, ani you are the tzaddik, ve'ani ve'ami harishayim. What was Paro saying? So we normally assume that what Paro was saying was, he was saying to God, you know, you're right. But now that you read this Gemara, you understand that Paro was also using a mechanism of prayer to God. Wow. See that? But again, only when you learn, the more you learn, the more you can apply to other areas of Torah. The more you know. Okay. Okay. And every person, every man, the pasuk continues and says, "Return from their evil ways, and from the chamasa, from the robbery, and from the theft that was in their palms." My, what does that mean? From the robbery that was in their hands. If you already told me that they returned from their evil ways, then there's obviously no robbery in their hands. Shmuel, Shmuel says, "Wild." Even if there was a person who stole a beam, a wood beam, he built it into his palace, into his castle, into his home. He would be forced by the decree of the king of Nineveh to take apart his whole house, smash down the house, and return that stolen beam in the middle of his house to the owner. How do we know this? Because the point is, what would happen if the guy, let's say he would go back to the owner, he would say, here's $50 for the beam. Page you off. Even if he doesn't want the beam. Since I took that forcibly, so I was, I, the Pasuk says, you return from the evil in his ways. I return from the evil in his ways. But I still have, I have something stolen. It's still in my possession. So the only way to get out of is to physically return it. So you had people who were incurring tremendous losses in order to be able to have their hands clean completely from Hamas. What's the difference between Hamas and Gezela? Gezela is when you stole something. Hamas, the halacha, is even if you pay for it. So let's say as an example, you have a, a store I want, right? You have a building. In between my two buildings, I want to make an extension. I come to you, I say to you, I want to buy it for half a million dollars. That's the value. You say, I'm not selling. I say, a million dollars, ten million dollars. You say, I'm not selling. This is the house I grew up in, my parents, I don't want to sell it. I beat you up, I make you sign a deed, I gave you $20 million. Hamas, it's not stealing. Not only did I pay for it, I paid that money times more than the value. But you forced someone to do something they don't want to do, and therefore this object is in your hands, not because it was willingly transferred its ownership, but because you figured out a way to force the person. And forcing a person could be a lot of different ways. A lot of different types of ways of forcing people. You can force someone with a gun, you can force someone legally. You can force someone, you could find ways of pressuring a person, blackmailing a person. That's all called Hamas. So over here, the Pasuk says they return from the evil of their ways. And from the Hamas, the, the things that they had taken powerfully um, from, from other people. So they built, they would knock down the house. And look at the Teshuvah of the people of Nineveh. Very powerful Teshuvah. Amar Rav Ada Barava. Rav Ada Barava says, Adam sheish biyado avera. A person who has in his hands a sin. Umitvadeh. And he goes and he does vidui, boom, 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 boom. Banging on his chest. Ve'eno chozerba. But he has not done teshuvah. Right? He's not returned the object. Excuse me. He does teshuvah, but he hasn't returned the object. Lema'u dome. What is he compared to? Le'adam shetofesh sheish biyado. A guy is holding the carcass of one of the animals that if it dies and you touch it, you become tameh. Okay? grabs this uh, dead rat, dead sheretz, and he goes into the mikveh. So how do you normally become pure from touching the animal, right? You go to the mikveh, you become pure. But the second he goes into the mikveh, he comes down, he's pure, he's still holding the sheretz. So as at every split second when he's trying to become tahor, he's simultaneously re-becoming tameh again. So he never loses his status of, of tumah. Shafilu tobel, even if he dips 
in every single body of water in the world. Travel the world and the seven seas. The guy dips everywhere. No, it's not going to help at all. Why? He does not, his tevila does not help him. Zarkomi Yado, he throws it out of his hand. Kivan Ba'arba'im Sa'ah. If he dips in enough water that roughly fills a deep bathtub, Miyad Al Talo Tevila. He dipped in every ocean, the guy. Didn't help him. But if he releases, if he throws away the Sheretz and he dips in 40 Sa'ah, which is the size of a Mikveh, um, Al Talo Tevila is Tevila. Helps him and he becomes pure Shinemar. Like the Pasuk says, Umodeve Ozev. Yerucham. If he admits and he lets go, Yerucham, he will find, uh, he will find uh, uh, um, mercy from God. Ve'omer, and the Pasuk says, similarly, same concept. el kapayim, el el We say that on Shabbat, where we say we will lift our hearts, el kapayim. One idea is that we will lift our hands, and our hearts. They used to pray, again, we don't pray like this now, but they used to pray with their hands up like this in supplication, like this to God. Sometimes I do it in my tefillah, not, you don't stand there like this, like your Moshe Rabbeinu and I'm the war Amalek, but there's yeah. times when you feel, especially by the way when I'm praying alone. Oof. You know, you lift your hand. I do the same thing sometimes. Yeah. It's very... It's it's instinctually. Instinctually. And you really have kavana and you need something. You need, yeah. yeah it, from, you're reaching from the depth. You're reaching deep down. But that's an example of the props that they were using in Tefillah. God doesn't hear you better because you raised your hands. Right? What is he? That mean teacher that makes you raise your hand and go to the bathroom? Right? What is, you have to raise it? No. But when the person feels that, they're reaching out. It's interesting also. When people suffer extreme trauma, extreme trauma, what, the, what happens a lot of times... They go on the floor and they curl up in a ball and they're rocking back and forth. Right? When a person has like an a anxiety attack, what are they doing? It's literally called the fetal position. Why? The person subconsciously is yearning for a time when they felt safe, for a time when they had someone taking care of everything for them. So the body, it has like a muscle memory for a time that it felt safe and it can revert without the person thinking about it. Right? Into that, into that stage to once again feel, feel that way. Remarkable. Okay? So one pshat is that we will raise our hearts to heaven and our hands, but there's another interpretation that says we will raise our hearts in our hands. Like sometimes people, there's an expression, with my heart in my hand, right? They would lift their hearts. God says don't do the motion of prayer. Don't strike the pose of prayer, right? Rather than lift your hands to the heavens, Lift your heart up in Teshuvah, in connection, in El Bashamayim, to God in heaven. Going back to the idea of uh, the people in Nineveh who understood that you can't do Teshuvah and still have the other guy's beam in your house and you're standing on that beam while you're praying. Okay? It doesn't work. Amdu Batifila. They stood in Tefillah. Moridim Ifnea Teva Zaken. When they started to go and pray, they would put, the, they would have. Descend to the Teva as I can. Why do we say Moridim? We said in the Gemara already that they would dig down in the old shuls they would have, in the old synagogues, they would, the Chazan would actually be praying not higher on the Bima, but rather they would dig out a couple uh, uh, inches into the ground so the Chazan was lower than the people to fulfill the words of Mima Makim Kirati Hashem that I called out to you, God, from the depths. That humility that comes from the chazan being a little bit lower, um, and I've even seen synagogues where for the sake of acoustics, they had to raise the chazan, so they took three steps or four steps up on a platform, and then you got onto the platform and there was a lip down with the chazan, so they accomplished both shilam ha'alot esayinayil he'arim and shilam ha'alot yamakim. Says the Gemara, Tanu Rabbanan, Amdu batifilah, they stood in prayer, Afa pishia shamza ken v'chacham, even if there's a wise and a scholarly person the person needs to be someone who is proficient who is an expert who is uh, it is common for him he has a habit if you will of being able to pray properly right why because the guy's going to pray we don't can't have the guy tripping over his words he's not sure what to say Rabbi Yudah says, 
Rabbi Yehuda says a list of things that the person needs. Now, what happens if the guy is a chacham and a zaken, but he doesn't know how to pray properly because he's not used to it? We'd rather have the ragil than have the zaken and chacham. Why? This is interesting. One reason is because one of the simanim that a person's prayers are accepted is if they're not stu- stumbling over the words. <clears throat> so we don't, have, we don't want to have a scenario where the person is stumbling over the words and then the people think, oh, forget it. Look, you see, my prayers are not being answered and they'll give up and they won't pray properly. Because the whole point of the zaken, as we said earlier, the zaken, the chacham, the adam shel tzura, the point was that the people should listen, should get into this, should, be, should have their hearts um, kind of uh, in the right place. Rabbi Yudah lists some of the things that were required for the chazan on the time of the ta'anit. Mitupal ve'enlo. He's, some, he's someone who has children. Ve'enlo, he has nothing in the house with which to feed them. That's a guy who feels the pinch. He's going to pray his heart out. Ve'yeshlo. Ve'yeshlo yegi'aba sadeh, says the Gemara. He also needs to be someone who works hard in the field. Ubeto rekam. And his house is empty. He's got no provisions. He doesn't have a, a, you know, a backup fridge with more meat from boutique or from uh, prime, grip, prime rib. The guy has nothing. His cupboards are bare. Shval berech. He's humble. Shval berech means uh, low. His knees are low. Someone who's like, like crouching down in humility. Umirutse, sorry, pirkona er is, we'll see what pirkona er means. Literally it means his beard is nice. But we'll see another interpretation of the word pirko. Vishval berech and humble. Umirutse la'am and the people like him. He's well liked by the people. Okay? <clears throat> he has a pleasant way about him and he has a nice voice. He's an expert in reading Nevi'im, Torah Nevi'im Ketuvim, Tanakh. And he also knows how to teach the Halachot and the Agadot in the Torah. And he's also um, a master, an expert in all the Be'achot Kulan, and how to say the blessings. Now, first of all, as we're going along this list, right? <laughs> exactly. This sounds like the way today's women come to me when they're asking for Shiduchim. He needs to be, he needs to be, he needs to be, he needs to be, he needs to be. And I'm thinking to myself, Hazaku Baruch, ain't nobody in the world like that. Okay? Rabotai, let's carry on. Says the Gemara, Rabbi Yehuda finishes this list. And all the rabbis, at the same time as he finishes this list, they all looked at Rabbi Yitzhak Barami. First of all, you give anything to be Rabbi Yitzhak Barami, right? Shema Yisrael. Okay, let's, um, let's continue. <clears throat> Everybody looked at this great rabbi, Rabbi Yitzhak Barami, who had, who had all of those characteristics. Now, I just want to just ask one question. Now, I understand why he needs to read. I understand why he needs to be humble. I understand why he needs some of these things. But why, why does the guy need to be able to teach halachot and agadot? Why does the guy need to know Tanakh? So Tanakh is easier. You know why? Because a lot of the things, the be'achot that we're going to read on the Ta'anit, like we already saw, they reference, right, pesuk, actual pesukim. So if the guy knows how to read, if he knows Tanakh, then it's more likely he'll be able to pray. Remember, they also didn't have prayer books. It's by heart, right? Now, yeah, it's all by heart. So if you go to the synagogues in uh, Russia, Poland, Germany, you know, uh, the, in many of the synagogues in Iraq, Iran, you find the old shuls, the old places. They had painted on the walls many of the prayers of Shabbat. Birich Shemeh, that we're all used to, the sign, Birich Shemeh, right? that hangs on the walls of all the different synagogues, uh, they used to have not just Berich Shemeh, they would also have Lecha Dodi, all the verses of, uh, so of Kabbalah Shabbat. Them? Is that the reason we hang them on the walls? Part of the reason, yeah. It's, right now it's pointless. Why? They didn't have Sidurim, but the people, many of them, because of the consistency, they knew the prayers of the week. Mm-hmm. But the prayers of Shabbat, they didn't know. So they put on the walls many of the prayers, the, wow. the prayers of, uh, of Birkat Rosh Chodesh. Mm-hmm. So you could go now and you see, there's many synagogues I've been to that have been restored and you can see faded either that it's gone or they've redone them, but they have the prayers redone, uh, you know, for, for Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, of, of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. 
I've seen Cal Nidre on the wall. Right? It's Wild. Fantastic. fantastic, yeah? So um, the, they didn't know the prayers. So who's going to be leading them? A guy who's most likely, so he's Baki in the prayers. But these prayers were not the regular prayers. And they incorporated various verses. So what we wanted was someone that knew those verses. But then why does he need to know the halachot and the agadot? So I think I have a simple answer to that question. And the answer is on two levels. Number one, he needs to know the halachot. Why? Because if a person messes up on the beracha, if a person, so you get flustered. But a person who knows the halacha, he knows exactly what the halacha is if he didn't finish it, where he goes back to, what he says, etc., etc. He knows which barachot he's obligated. So that's also part of his uh, flow in the way that he prays. But why does he need to know the agadot? Which are the, the, uh, more, the stories, the midrashic interpretations of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the Torah? And the answer is, because when we say, Mi she'ana Abraham b'hara moriah, Mi she'ana, to he who answered. So someone who has a rudimentary knowledge understands the simple you know, ideas about how God answered those people in those moments. But the more the person knows about that story, the more heartfelt his beracha is going to be. Because he's understanding the parallels. He's understanding Zohar Kol and Shachol. Let's give one example. The Mishnah said that um, we pray that God who answered our, our forefathers that left Egypt, right? And, and he saved them from Egypt. Ki Zohar Kol and Shachol. Atta, you remembered all the forgotten ones. We describe the Jews in Egypt as the forgotten ones. Because two, ten years they were rotting in Egypt. And they felt like God had forgotten them. So this person, he's able to conjure up, if he knows the Agadot, he conjures up all the elements of the pain and the suffering the Jewish people were going through in Egypt, because he knows all those Midrashim, all those Agadot, and therefore he can apply them in his mind when he's praying to God uh, that we should also be saved from those things. Like the Pasuk says, Kol ha-machala asher samti b'misraim, all the sicknesses that I placed in Egypt, lo asim, Alecha, I will not place it on you. So when the guy is saying, the guy, the one that answered, the Jews in Egypt, if he can recall all the sicknesses, all the challenges they went through, his biracha is so much more powerful because he's protecting. In fact, in the Haggadah, I don't know if you noticed, there's a three-way machloket on the makot. One opinion says, they were, how many makot were there in Egypt? Ten, we know there's ten in Egypt. How many were on the sea? Three. Fifty. Why? Because it says, it's by leukemia about the makot, God's finger. If God's finger was ten, and then it says five different expressions in the Yamsuf, so what's five times what we had in Egypt? Fifty. The second opinion says, no, how many makot were there in Egypt? Each makah had within it, right, uh, four different elements. And the Gemara brings the pasuk that proves that. Forty. So what's five times forty? How many miracles were there in the ocean? Forty times five. 200. The last opinion says, how many, how many, no, there were five elements to each makkah in Egypt. So how many makot were there in Egypt? Technically, 50. Therefore, how many uh, miracles were there in the ocean? 250. Estimate Fashim, what are we doing here? This sounds like creative accounting. Yeah. <laughs> trying to increase, right? Like, you know, you, you're trying to, uh, like, talk about the, uh, what is it called uh, when you write off the uh, depreciation? Is that the, my house? 250 it's worth. How that has a shack, it's falling down. Right? Is it, what, that's what we're doing over here? The answer is that they give is the Pasuk says, Kola machalash I'm not going to, if you do right, all, everything I gave the Egyptians, I'm not going to give you. The more we give the Egyptians, the more we've written off on our rider of Kola machalash So therefore also, this Chacham, if he knows the Agadic interpretations, if he can come up with 50 Makor in Egypt, Right? Then Zohar Kol Nishkachot Atta, he's able to bring that in to his tefilot, uh, to his tefilot as well. Um, says the Gemara, Hainu Metupal Ve'enlo, same thing. Hainu Betorekam. Rabbi Yehuda lists all these different things. One of the things he lists is, we turn the page to 17, to 16b, and if you're following the English 16b1, he has children Ve'enlo, means he has nothing. Hainu bayit rekam. That's the same as the other thing that you said, that he has an empty house. Because enlo means he has nothing. Beto rekam means he has nothing in his house. Amar av chizda, zehu she beto rekam in avera. It doesn't mean beto rekam, he has nothing in his cabinet. That we said already. Beto rekam means his house is empty from sins. 
He's got nothing going on in the walls of his house. Two interpretations. One interpretation is, means he never sinned. Other interpretation means there's nothing in his house which was achieved or gotten were through illegal gains. It's not, uh, he hasn't stolen anything. None of his possessions are of questionable origin, right? I think the second opinion kind of arose to think, who's a person that doesn't have a single sin in his house? You know, this hazan is unobtainable. <laughs> I was thinking to myself when I was learning this, how does the first person understand this? Beto, right? The guy is Rekam. You don't have a sin. The Gemara says there's only seven people in the history of the world that didn't commit a sin. Amram is one of them, by the way. According to another one opinion, Benjamin was one of them. Certain people never committed sin, but there's seven in the history of the world. And Sadiq, the Pasuk says, and Sadiq Ba'aretz, Asher Ya'ase Tov Lo Yechta. There's no righteous person in the world that does good and doesn't, doesn't sin. There's, they don't view it impossible. So why, you're not going to find a chazan. How does the first person find anybody? The first interpretation. Maybe when he was so, a kid. So I thought, sorry? When he was a young boy? He He's, he, uh, when he was young, he wasn't a sinner. So what we're going to call, uh, you, you mean for back then, but now he has. Everybody has. But everybody has. So who's the chazan? So I had a novel interpretation of chidush. I think that's the point. We go through this list, and slowly but surely, everybody gets knocked off the list until there's nobody. And I have a proof of this. Someone, anyone have a uh, sidur? Yeah. Yeah, give me a sidur, right? He's I have a proof. Over there. Ready? We say on, on Monday and Thursday in the Tachanun, in the Tachanun it says, <clears throat> This is a good one. This is a beauty. You're going to like this. What's going on here? Is this Sidur missing? Oh. <laughs> I'm in Mincha. I keep turning back and forth. I can't find the Shachari. Okay, fine. Says, says the Tahanun. Anshe Muna Avadu, men of faith are lost to us. We come in the strength of their actions. We don't have them. Those righteous ones, the strengthy ones, the ones that the strong ones, that they were able to stand up against the breaches in the wall, they would knock off the gezerot from Shamaim. They were a wall for us, an iron dome. They were they gave us refuge in a day of anger. Uh, heavenly anger. Zoachim af hasham. They could whisper and uh, and bring down, so to speak, the uh, the upset of God. Hema asru b'shavam. Hashem's uh, dis- displeasure with us. They were able to stop b'shavam with their prayers. Tam kiraucha Hashem. You answered them right away. Yodim la'ator la'atzot. They knew how to pray. They knew how to find favor. Ke'avri chamta le'ma'anam. You 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 had pity on them like a father. Lo shivotu preem rekam. You never turned them back empty-handed. Ready for this? In our great sins, we lost all these leaders, all these sadikim. They were taken from us, from our sins. They went off to places of, uh, of comfort. And we are left now for terrible situations. There's no one left anymore. So anyone who's worthy of pushing off your anger to give to get your uh, your grace afasu there's none left shotadnu ba'arba pinot we looked in all four corners tiru falo masanu we have no there's no salvation there's no salve shavnu elecha beboshet baneno so we return to you in humility with embarrassment the shacharach el beetz beetz aroteno to to gain forgiveness from you uh, you know in our time of need this checklist was not supposed to find anybody. They're supposed to turn to the Keila and say, okay, do we have a guy who's old? He's wise? You know, or is he, uh, does he have children? He's got nothing in the house? You know, Pirkona, he's got a nice beard, he's humble. Anyone, anyone? So thinning the herd. Less and less people. Mirutse la'am, everybody likes him. You, have, you know of a rabbi that everybody likes? You know what they used to say? If everybody likes the rabbi, everybody, he's not doing his job. <laughs> right? Very serious. 
Because if you're standing up for something, you're going to get someone upset. Yes. No one's upset with you. Everybody loves you. You're not doing your job. He's got to have a beautiful voice. He's got to be sweet, strong and sweet. <laughs> right? All these things. Baki and everything. That's my, that's my hidush on the first uh, part of the Gemara. We are actually setting the bar so high. The second opinion says, no, that's not the way to get to people's hearts. It's a good move, you know? But you know what? The people, they're not going to get it. So find the best that you can. So at least you have a good shaliach tzibur. Betore kamen avera, the second opinion in it, which is that at least there's no, nothing stolen in his house. Says the Gemara, upirko na'e. What does pirko na'e mean? Literally, according to some opinions, it means he has a nice beard, okay? But the Gemara here says a different understanding. Amar shem rabi yalduto. This is a guy who, even when he was young and stupid, he didn't have a bad name in the community. He didn't have anything that people spoke about him. This guy, he did all these terrible things, blah, 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 okay? Now, it's interesting. Because if that's the understanding of, the, of what Pirko Na'e means, and here we're retranslating the word Pirko to the word Perik. Perik means a chapter-like, okay? So Pirko, his chapter, Na'e. Even that, like, that chapter, that episode. But again, most people, when is their chapter, the chapter where they're least likely to be, you know, pristine, it's when they're young and stupid, Right? So, <clears throat> this guy, we're looking for someone who was Adami, who was sweet, who was a Sadiq even back then. Look at Rashi, second line from the top. He was good without Shemra. Now, again, what I want to point out is, Abaye is not saying the guy was perfect. He was saying he was good enough that the guy had a good name. Even a guy with a good name is not perfect. But, there's a certain level at which people start talking about you that you're not a good guy. Okay? So at the very least, there was never a time that people spoke badly about this guy, that he's someone, he's a bad apple. The, we continue. My uh, portion was like like a lion <coughs> in the yard, in the forest. Called out to me with its voice. Therefore I hated it. What does it mean? It gave to me its voice. Ama Mazuta Bartuvia. Mazuta Bartuvia said in the name of Rav. Some people say it was Rabbi Hama in the name of Rabbi Alazar. A Shaliach Tibur, a Hazan that goes to the Teva and he's not appropriate. People don't like him. He's not a, a Sadiq. He's a, unfortunately, he's a very bad guy. The Pasuk says. When someone goes that way to me and comes to call out, God says about that person, like a lion calling out in the forest, roaring, I hated it. The wrong shaliach tzibur evokes in God, so to speak, the exact opposite of what we're trying to achieve. Sometimes you have a chazan, and the chazan is wonderful, the best voice in the world. The guy is a womanizer, the guy is a, a cheat, the guy is a, you know, a, a temper, the guy is a, okay. you know, ganav. But his voice is beautiful, can't fault him. Important to understand, this guy, he's not called a singer, a mishorer. He's not called a singer, he's shaliach tzibur. He's the emissary, right? Shaliach tzibur, he's the... He's the emissary of the tzibur. Could you imagine that we needed to ask a huge favor from the president? Right? Probably you try and find someone who knew the president from back in the day. They were friendly. Someone who donated money to the, to the president's campaign. Someone who the president likes. Right? Could you imagine someone sending someone that stands for everything that the president hates? You know, president is about this, the guy is the, the president is this, the guy is the other thing. President is this. You know, however convincing the guy is, however good he is with his words, he walked in, you lost the case. God says, why are you putting this guy up? He's shaliach tzibur. This is not about singing. It's true that the guy, if you're choosing between two people who are, are appropriate, the guy with the nice voice, he's going to get the people more into it. He's going to move them. So that's an added bonus. But if that's the only bonus, 
it's going to have the exact opposite desired effect that you think it's going to have. So rahit, get rid of the guy. Don't, that should not be your shaliyah tzibur. Especially in a time <clears throat> of famine when HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in a seat of judgment. Okay, let's just do this last piece here. He says in front of them 24 berachot, 18 that he says every day. We add another six. What do you mean six we add? The, the Mishnah that we just read actually said, the first one is, the second one is, the third one is, the, one is, the, one is, the, one is, the last one it says, and the seventh one is, Sheva Havyan. There's seven new berachot. Kiditnan, like we read in the Mishnah, Allah Shevi Itu Omer. On the seventh, he says, Baruch Merachem ala Aretz. Amar Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak answers, My Shevi'it, what is the seventh? Shevi'it la Arucha, the seventh to lengthen. Kidetanya be Goel Yisrael, in the Beracha of Goel Yisrael, Ma'arich, he extends it. Ubi Chotama, and in the signing off of the Beracha, Hu Omer, Misha Ana et Avraham Bar Amoria, Hu Yane, Etrem, he should answer you. Vishma bekol tzakatrem, he should listen to the voice of your calling out. Hayom azeh on this day. Baruch ko el Yisrael. Vehen onin acharav. Amen. And they answer after him. Amen. So the seventh beracha. What does he say? The seventh beracha. He doesn't change the beracha because goel Yisrael is the same beracha that we say every single day. <clears throat> so there's seven berachot that we extend. But there's six berachot that we change the beracha. So therefore, it's 18. <coughs> it's 18 berachot that we have every day, plus the six that we changed. But the Mishnah is telling you that there are seven where there's an addition to the beracha. We add extra firepower by saying, Avraham Avinu He should also answer you. But the beracha itself is unchanged. Therefore, there's 18 berachot plus 6. We're going to continue. Um, <clears throat> we're going to continue from here. Be'ezat Hashem next week. Uh, sorry. Oh, one second. Wednesday. Are we still around? I am not. I'm oh, Wednesday is the night before uh, every, people are traveling. So I'm not sure. We'll see. I'll, I'll let you guys know. Okay? Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.